Uh, so Ari, first of all, uh, thanks very much for talking to me today. It's very valuable for students of entrepreneurship to hear from someone who's actually done it and, uh, and also who comes from the University of Waterloo. So the people who are watching this can imagine that one day perhaps they'll be sitting in your shoes and talking to me about their success. That's what we hope for. Uh, so you're the co-founder and chief operating officer of Monster Cat. Uh, it's the independent electronic dance music record label uh, and Canada's biggest, as far as I understand it. Uh, can you describe for people what this business is all about, uh, especially for people who, for some reason, may not be familiar with it? Sure. So Monster Cat's a record label and technology business. Uh, what a record label is, is we sign rights to music from all over the world and we distribute it. Um, it's actually very simply just kind of that. Um, where the technology comes in is we're the only record label that pays artists on a monthly basis. Uh, so we built a technology that allows us to manage these, these assets, these licenses, and uh, that's been very important for us to create this creative economy between the artists that we support. Um, so what we noticed was that once we started paying these guys, they quit their jobs, they started producing music full time, and we had a wonderful kind of feedback system. Um, so them producing more better quality music for the label and uh, them getting paid and being sustainable to do so. Um, and then on the distribution side, we have a massive exposure mechanism, which allows those guys to kind of get a leg up in the industry, some recognition. Wonderful and, and clearly uh, very successful. So Monster Cat is what we might describe as a disruptive innovation uh, inside the music business. So how did you come up with the idea for the radical approach that the business has adopted and how did you know that it would be commercially successful? Well, when we first started the business, I guess we went uh, head first into thinking, okay, we have a bunch of artists, they're not making money, they're, let's figure out how to make money from these, these tracks they have. Uh, they all had YouTube channels, and um, so what we did was we found a distributor that we could run independently. It's actually a platform uh, that anybody can use called TuneCore, and we got an advertising deal with YouTube. And so what we did was we didn't know anything about the music industry. We signed these rights, um, worked with a lawyer to get those, and then we said, okay, let's make some money for these guys. So we partnered their YouTube channels, and we started selling their, their records through Monster Cat, the central hub. And really what happened was in the first three months, we had made $6,000 from record sales, but we made $26,000 from advertising on the YouTube space. So we scaled that up as quickly as we possibly could because we thought we have a feasible business here. Record sales are gonna increase as we get grow in size, as we grow in size, more artists, more fans. Uh, that economy will start to grow, but in the advertising space, that's where we can partner a large network to help fuel the growth of our company. And uh, that's kind of how we first started. You know, We didn't know the standard models of the industry, we, so we just signed these guys on a per track basis. Um, very friendly towards artists. I worked with an artist advocate for our first agreement so that we could create a good revenue sharing model. And uh, yeah, that you would have thought there would be this chicken and egg scenario. Artists wouldn't sign if there was no distribution or exposure. Um, but, but it all started so organically that, uh, that the machine kind of got going. Very interesting. And uh, so presumably you didn't have investors or did you have investors inside your business? No, we were bootstrapped since the beginning. So luckily Mike and I started the business when we were still in university in fourth year. Um, so we still had our university funds and we were just, you know, working. I was working while in co-op, while in school term. And uh, he was working as well while he was in school. And um, the business became cash flow positive to the point where we actually got our first office in the Accelerator Center, started hiring our first employees. And we just scaled up uh, very slowly from there. Okay, so how did your business model develop? Uh, did you get this right first time or did you have various versions and things that you tried out before you got to the model that is successful for you today? 
Yeah, so I suppose our business model is based on revenue sharing on assets. So if you can imagine a piece of music, a license is an asset with different splits between different parties. Um, so basically, a, a musical asset is quite complicated. There's a publishing side to it uh, where the writers get paid and there's a master side where the record labels get paid. And it's very complicated um, as far as assets go. So basically our model was, when we get money in, we split it amongst the stakeholders and the money goes out right away on a monthly basis. And that actually hasn't changed. Um, that's just been developing over time to include more revenue sources. Um, and really we started with that and it's been working fantastically. Wonderful and, and great news that it is too. So, uh, so you're the co-founder of Monster Cat. Um, uh, to what extent did the skills and personalities within your business team uh, complement each other? How did people work together and how important was that to your business? Well, I think it's very important to find the right, the right founders, the right people to work with, um, that you can leverage their strengths. Um, so they kind of cover some of your weaknesses and you can work with them just like any school team. You know kind of who's the weak link when you start you know, you know, working with them and you know how to cover for those kind of uh, those weaknesses. So I think in the very beginning with uh, uh, Mike and myself, it was a very good relationship. Um, I worked more on the operations and technically he worked more on the brand. Uh, our first two employees came on, one worked full time on the music and the other was our, now our CTO and he worked full time on the technology. So we really had four guys plus some external people working on very independent parts of the business, um, all working towards that one, one thing which was you know, the growth of the, the numbers, the sales, the, the artists, the music and everybody complemented each other um, in the roles that they set into. Okay, so, so clearly the roles that people played were, uh, were important and how they worked together was important. How did you grow the business to the state that it's at now? Uh, did you go through various stages to get to this point? Uh, can you uh, perhaps describe the key developments that your business went through as it grew? Sure, so what we've been doing is we've been incrementally growing um, for the last four years. So we've been doing everything, we take everything we do, we assess and we see if we can do it better. Um, we also invest in R&D. Um, that's very important because Music is our product, and every product undergoes a life cycle. You know the <clears throat> initial stages uh, to growth, to maturity, and decline. And uh, you can hit those ceilings, those market saturations, when you have a product um, in the market. So it was very important for us to invest in research and development, for example, in our technology or in products that maybe wouldn't come out or be revenue generating for a couple of years, um, so that when we do undergo these phases changes that we'll have new products ready for the market and some of those things are our artist development project uh, our technology is in consistent research and development so we're building a new type of API distribution which is very exciting um, and fundamentally when our music is getting of better quality we just need to work on new exposure mechanisms to show people that hey check it out it's better now, it's, it's changing, uh, because it's very difficult when you have a stream of music every Monday, Wednesday, Friday uh, for four and a half years to keep people interested um, in that. So we're really always constantly developing that. And now our organization has spread out into different departments and different teams. Um, for example, our live events team is developing, uh, developing its brand and its strategy. And so you know, we invest into these things and hopefully each of these teams grows, gets better quality over time. And, and that's how we've been able to kind of maintain uh, the growth that we have. So you're describing new services and areas that the business is moving into. Mm -hmm. How do you decide which of those areas you're going to focus on? Um, as you as your business develops well we really we follow the money I suppose so we we take a look at all of these things and we see we assess them on a stakeholder basis so we assess them how are the fans going to react to this how are the artists going to react to this how is the industry going to react to this how does the brand personified react to this and how do we internally react to this um, so we assess all of these projects on that basis and depending on what value it provides to that entire ecosystem we move forward with it and obviously a lot of these projects uh, once they come out of the research 
research and development phase need to be profit generating um, unless they're providing significant value to uh, some of the stakeholders that can be kind of funneled off from another project or another revenue engine. Thank you. And so you're a successful entrepreneur, clearly. Uh, what prepared you in your uh, life as you grew up and, uh, uh, and moved through your education? What prepared you to be the entrepreneur that you are today? Well, I started my first business when I was 16. I was the first online bike shop in Canada. Uh, so that really taught me a lot. I was managing a store, I had suppliers, I had inventory, I was doing shipping, I had my own business bank accounts and doing my own finances and taxes with my dad. Um, so that, that really did prepare me for, for the next business because I knew kind of fundamentally what, what needs to go on underneath the business. It's, you know, it's finance, it's people, it's, uh, it's your legal strategy, it's your supply chain. Um, so when I came onto Monster Cat, that's how, that's how I applied all of those principles there. Um, and then furthermore, in the education piece, uh, the program here at Waterloo did a great job at, uh, you know, informing me about different things, about supply chain, how to solve problems, uh, telecommunications, coding. Uh, you know, I developed, I was coding our first system uh, before we got our CTO. So uh, I was able to pick up a lot of skills from the school program, um, and especially through co-op as well. Leadership uh, was very important to pick up from all of my bosses that I worked with as well. So so I guess it's a cumulative uh, thing and um, you know just running into it uh, kind of head first and uh, just trusting yourself and working really hard. Wonderful and uh, as you're a graduate of the first cohort of our management engineering program here at Waterloo and uh, uh, hopefully one of the many successful students that we've had come from that. My final question uh, is around the advice that you might give to others who are uh, going to be watching this interview uh, and are thinking about becoming uh, entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, what would you say would be the most important advice that you might give to them? Well, I think it's when you're when you're starting with a new idea. You know, ideas are cheap. Everybody's got ideas. Everybody's got a thousand ideas. But what you really have to do is you have to look into it. How is it providing value for all of the different parties involved? And how are you going to make this a business uh, that makes money? I know a lot of ideas that just get thrown out there, and people start running and start throwing money at them. And really, they don't think about the long-term consequences. Is this going to be sustainable? Am I going to have build an ecosystem that uh, self-reliant? Um, and so taking a really good look at how the value is exchanged between all the different parties involved is important. And um, also to keep the technology, if you're building technology, you have to build it in-house. If you're building externally, it's going to be very difficult to manage. So make sure you take your skill set and apply that to your business. Great. Thanks very much for talking to me today, Ari. I know it will be of benefit to, uh, to all of the people who watch it. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks, Peter. Good to talk to you.